Hello, and welcome to the Water Buffs podcast, featuring in-depth interviews with experts discussing water problems and solutions. You'll find the audio version of this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. The video version is available on YouTube and Vimeo. Water Buffs is a production of The Water Desk, an independent journalism initiative based at the University of Colorado Boulder's Center for Environmental Journalism. Stay tuned until the end for more information. We hope you enjoy the show. Water issues are often complex. The facts, figures, and statistics can go over the heads of even the most experienced water buffs. And that's where data visualization can make all the difference. Welcome to Water Buffs. I'm your host, Mitch Tobin, and I'm really excited to have on the show my friend Jeff McGee, who's our data visualization consultant here at the Water Desk. And I'm excited to talk to him about maps and charts and graphics and dashboards and other data visualizations, which are a really important and effective tool for communicating about water issues. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks, Mitch. It's great to be here. Well, for starters, Jeff, uh, tell us a little bit about your career and some of the jobs that you've had working on data visualization. Uh, it goes back a couple of decades. Um, I think when the web came along and we saw a news uh, presentation migrating to this new format, I thought, what an amazing opportunity to communicate with people visually, to help them really understand stories, understand the, the, the factors behind them, and engage interactively and visually with them. Um, so I uh, worked at a number of organizations. I started my career at ABC News um, and moved to the New York Times. I was their first web graphics editor in 2000. Um, and I think what, what really struck me was how by communicating information visually, it not only helped resonate with readers, but it also created a kind of a visual fact check of the information that was going in the stories that were accompanying it. Um, and that was just an extraordinarily valuable uh, valorization of what data and what that kind of factual measured information means. Um, on top of that, it's also really an international and kind of um, uh, language that, that goes beyond words. Um, one of the first projects I did was a site for um, kids to teach them about news through data and through um, visual journalism. Uh, and I had the chance to go work in France and work on information graphics at Le Monde. After France, I came back to the U.S. to to engage with information visualization in a new way, and that was when I went to Stanford to learn about how to use computational means to do more sophisticated visualization. And while I was there, I did a documentary about information visualization and how journalists, artists, scientists, and a whole bunch of people were using it to both understand information and to communicate it to others. And that's what got me into working with environmental scientists, historians, all sorts of academic folks. Uh, in nine years at Stanford doing visualization there. Great, well, um, you've worked on a variety of different issues, environmental issues, other topics. Uh, when it comes to water, um, what are some of the challenges in terms of data visualization and um, why is data visualization helpful for explaining water issues? Well, you know, just looking at it in, in just in terms of the map, the simplest type of visualization and the most intuitive one, um, human civilization has succeeded in completely rewiring Western water. Um, we've got a river that runs backwards 700 miles, taking water from uh, Northern California to Southern California, for example. Uh, you've got aqueducts connecting the Colorado River system to places like San Diego and Los Angeles, and then the Central Arizona project going down to Phoenix and Tucson. Um, you know, so it's important for people to understand that we already have a huge human footprint in this system, and I think people get that but also that these are very large quantities of, of resources that are being moved around. Um, and the fundamental uh, factors that made it possible and made this work are starting to change. The Colorado River Compact was struck at a time of abnormal wetness. Mitch, I'm not even sure how abnormally wet it was. It was 500 years or so back in the 30s. Um, but they were sharing a pie that turns out to be a lot smaller on average than people thought. So. Um, there's just, there's an opportunity for education, but also for myth busting, helping people uh, get, get beyond misconceptions and also to understand some of the good things like that urban water use 
has gone drastically down per capita in a lot of southwestern cities. And that's been a big, big victory. So even as these cities have grown dramatically, they've been able to keep their needs under control. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's, I think data visualization is helpful not only for explaining the challenges and problems that we face, but also the solutions um, that can address those challenges. So one of the things that Jeff and I have worked on together for a number of years are a series of dashboards that we now have um, on our website, waterdesk.org. And these data visualizations are meant to track a variety of indicators that are relevant to water issues. So we have one on the drought monitor, one on the snowpack, precipitation, also a map showing major dams and reservoirs. So I'd like to talk uh, to you a little bit about that and uh, some of the features of these dashboards that we offer. So for starters, we have one on the U.S. Drought Monitor, which is perhaps the best known uh, measure of drought in the United States. So tell us a little bit about that interactive map and how folks can use it. Yeah, well, the Drought Monitor is a great resource for people understanding where things stand right now and how they fit into the historical context. Um, what we did with the Drought Monitor uh, sort of speaks to all of the visualizations we did, where we tried to take uh, an existing data source that could be more or less accessible to the general public and bring it into a standardized format where you could see the latest um, information from that source, but also navigate it back and forward in time and drill down to different geographic places. So what we do with the drought monitor is uh, the default view is the, is the full contiguous in the United States. And then you can click on a state to drill down to, to look at uh, the current drought conditions there and also how they've looked over the past 20 years. Um, and through that, you can see where the really dramatic droughts have been, whether it was Texas in 2011, the Midwest in 2012, or California and the Southwest really from say 2011 or 12 up through 2015. Um, and you can see just how, how drastic the situation has been and how much they come and go. Um, the other thing you can do is you can embed them. They're designed to work uh, both on mobile sizes and also on full screens. Um, and we take the narrative information each week, uh, the drought monitor publishes a little um, narrative summary of conditions in different areas and we put those as pins on a map. So we feel like we've packaged it pretty nicely and made it very portable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the, the drought monitor is important clearly if you're a water manager and you're trying to understand uh, what the water supply is like. I think there's also a political dimension to this in the sense that uh, reforms of policies and movement on water issues tends to happen when there's a drought and when that has people's attention. So in some ways, uh, the drought monitor is a barometer, if you will, of uh, willingness to address water issues and uh, attentiveness uh, on the part of the public. So a close, you know, that, that, that metaphor of barometer, you know, shows that um, we need a term to describe the, the basic instrumentation we use to get through life and understand where we are at a given point in time. And these dashboards, you know, the drought monitor is an index of a number of different factors done by human analysts. And so in that sense, it's sort of ready-made for wider consumption. But I think also, you know, when we think about uh, planning what you're going to do on the weekend, you look at the weather map, uh, how is my team doing in sports? You look at the standings and the stats. Um, climate and uh, climactic conditions have been needing these kinds of uh, scoreboards, if you will, for some time. And I think we're moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think one of the ways that we've conceived of these dashboards is um, analogous to uh, the many different types of indicators that are tracked in your daily newspaper, things like the stock market, sports uh, scores and statistics. And uh, we're kind of doing the same, but for the natural world and in particular for uh, you know the water supply. And um, uh, closely related to the drought monitor is the uh, dashboard that we have on precipitation in the United States. So tell us a little bit about how that one works. Yeah, that's a model done by um, Oregon State University called PRISM that tries to um, uh, estimate just how much rainfall or snow has fallen on any particular um, quadrant of the U.S. Uh, it's rolled up on the, a monthly basis, uh, although you can also see it on a daily, but you see more signal when you're looking at a month. And it's gridded out to about one kilometer square. So when you look at the map, if you zoom in far enough, you'll see sort of some pixelation. 
Uh, but what we do is we then take those squares and we add them up uh, to count the amount of rain in each state. Uh, and that goes back to 1981. Um, so it's a pretty long temporal uh, period. And you can see some of the big rain events. You can see a Hurricane Katrina. You can see uh, tremendous rainfall in the Northwest or uh, in the late 90s, the floods that wiped out many homes and communities in the Central Valley of California. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just looking at that map recently, it was very clear how dry it's been in uh, California uh, over the last month or two. Um, quite notable how um, what, the lack of precipitation there at a time when they tend to get a lot of their uh, rain and snow. So one other thing about that is that it not only shows you absolute numbers, which may mean something or nothing to you. Uh, you know, my state of Washington got 20 inches, 24 inches of rain in January, which seems like maybe a lot, maybe not. But keep in mind that Seattle, although it rains a lot, doesn't get that much rain in total. It usually gets around 40 inches a year. So imagine that it got most of the, more than half of the annual rainfall in the course of a month in a hilly city, you know, watch out. It could, uh, you could have some landslides coming. Right. Um, but the other thing I'll say is that you can switch into another mode where you look at the percentage of typical rainfall. And so it shows you, okay, I don't know whether, what that means, but you tell me, is that, is that a lot or a little? And it will veer towards more of a red color if it's less than usual or green if it's more than usual. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, one feature that I think would be really interesting to add to the precipitation map would be something that connects to um, databases people have collecting flood events, you know, because there have been some pretty catastrophic floods that we can see the larger conditions that lead to them. You look at uh, the hurricane in Houston a couple of summers ago and how that was a storm that just parked itself over Houston and dumped rain day after day after day. Um, until even the most well-developed storm defenses would just have nothing that they could do to, to, to respond to that. I think it was something like a trillion gallons of water fell on that city in three days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess staying on the topic of precipitation, the other dashboard that we have related to that is snowpack, which is uh, very crucial here in the American West. It supplies the bulk of the water in rivers like the Colorado, um, you know, this dashboard doesn't exactly come alive in August, but in the winter, it's really important to look at and to see what the uh, situation is. So tell us a little bit about how that one works. Yeah, well, snowpack is what they call the frozen reservoir in the sense that it does for free, um, capturing a huge amount of running water in the form of snow that can then be used as it melts during the growing season to nourish cities and agriculture and industry. Um, there aren't big enough reservoirs in the world to store all this water um, if it wasn't in the form of snow. Um, so the snowpack monitor is using data from SNOWTEL, which is the snow intelligence system put together by the National Atmospheric and Oceanic Administration, NOAA. Um, and what it does is uh, rather than just saying, well, how deep is the snow, which is a kind of an imperfect measure on a scientific level, um, it asks, if this snow were to melt and turn into water, how much water would that be? And then they use the, the sort of industry standard measure of water volume for large quantities, which is the acre foot. This is Water Words, a fast explanation of a bit of water lingo. I'm Hannah Lee Myers. Today's water word is acre feet. Acre feet is a unit of measurement commonly used in the United States to reference a large amount of water. One acre foot equals 325,851 gallons of water. An example of acre feet used in a sentence may be something like, the amount of water in Lake Mead has dropped from 28.5 million acre feet to 11.3 million acre feet. The definition of an acre foot is the volume of one acre of surface area to the depth of one foot. So if one foot of water is standing on a one acre space, that's an acre foot of water. Here's another way to get a feel for how much water an acre foot actually is. So an acre is 60% of a soccer field, 16 tennis courts, or 90% of a football field. So if you imagine a foot of standing water on a space about that big, 
you're correctly imagining an acre foot of water. Now back to the Water Buffs podcast. So we're converting all this snow that is being um, detected by satellite. And I think it's looking basically at a photographic image of, of the snow and, and radar and attempting to figure out how much volume of water is in it. And then saying if this water melted or more accurately when this water melts, how much water is that gonna give uh, water managers? And so you can see in a state like Washington or California, there may be anywhere from 20 to 40 to 60 to 80 million acre feet of water in snow. And to keep in that, that in context, I think California uses about 30 or 40 million acre feet of water every year. Um, and so that's, you know, that's money in the bank for them. Unfortunately, this is a terrible snow year for California, even as other states are getting a, a healthy amount. Um, there was some early snow pack that, that developed in, I think in November and December, and that has basically started to melt and has not been replaced by new snow. And so one of the things you can see is that may not be so apparent on the map, um, but we have on larger screens, if you enlarge your monitor to over, I think 1100 pixels, so like a desktop, uh, you'll see a chart that shows a time series plotting the last 13 or 14 years of snowpack as a trend line from October to the following June, which we think of as the snow year. And you can see uh, the really big years like 2009, 2010, and then the uh, nightmare year of 2015 where there was virtually no snow at all. Mm -hmm. And those types, of, uh, those types of years have really, really dire consequences. And you can bet that when you get a year like 2015, that drought monitor is going to blow up a few months later. Yep, they are all connected. And the uh, one other dashboard that we should talk about is a little bit different than the others, uh, which track various uh, forms of precipitation and the impacts. Uh, the final one is on dams and reservoirs, which are really critical uh, parts of our water infrastructure. So tell us a little bit about that dashboard. Right, yeah. And, you know, uh, as a sort of a bit of the ancient history of EcoWest, it, it started when, Mitch, you were doing a survey for uh, a foundation of um, what were the available resources for people to um, understand climate and understand trends in climate and environment. And um, you collected an enormous amount of information. Uh, and we thought about how, if we want to collect that and share it, that information is a moving target. And just because you've got it for one year, you don't have it for uh, the six months later uh, that it might be. And so we wanted to look at ways to make those um, track information on an ongoing basis. And that requires a lot of backend programming and a lot of um, you know, mucking around and, and trying to figure out how to pull in these data sources and display them in a consistent way. Um, so those are the trackers like snowpack and drought and precipitation, wildfires. Um, on the other hand, reservoirs is uh, something where we just took a static database, database or a database that doesn't update very often, the Global Reservoirs and Dams Database, GRAND, that's put together by a consortium of academic folks around the world. Um, and that is just what it sounds like. It's a, it's a registry of, of dams and, and reservoirs, water impoundments, as they say, around the world. We drilled down to just the United States, uh, and that's several hundred dams that, um, if anyone who's read Cadillac Desert or similar books knows that the golden age of dam building is far behind us in the US. Uh, the, in fact, it goes back to the mid 1800s all the way to the, to the 1950s, 60s or so, the tremendous expansion in hydropower, uh, irrigation dams, um, uh, navigation dams, so you could uh, have locks and things like that were built. And um, just, a, just a tremendous amount of water capacity, storage capacity was created by these. And so what you see in our dashboard is it shows not only the locations of all the dams in the US, but they're uh, uh, represented as circles showing their capacity. Uh, and at the bottom of the screen, much like with the other dashboards, you have a time series that shows basically how the total amount of water storage capacity grew over time. Uh, that's a notional uh, capacity, of course, because a lot of these dams have silted up over the years and the reservoirs are not what they once were, or the inputs are not what they once were, or the outputs are definitely not what they once were. If you look at like Lake Powell or Lake Mead and the amount of water going to the big growing cities in the Southwest. So um, it's, it's kind of a fun way to explore the, 
uh, incredible network of water impoundments that we've built around the country. Uh, and one side uh, note is that you can switch modes and you can actually uh, look at all the dams and reservoirs by what their main, not their only, but their main purpose is, whether it's irrigation, flood control, um, hydropower, uh, or even recreation. Uh, in fact, there are some dams that appear to have a primary purpose of recreational purposes, which I guess is to have fishing lakes and, and such things. Um, so yeah, it's just a window into something kind of dry and you know not usually foregrounded and it's a chance to celebrate that. Maybe sort of an electronic version of a John McPhee article in the New Yorker or something like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, you know, we'd encourage folks to check these out on waterdust.org and play around with them and let us know what you think. And you mentioned, Jeff, that um, not only can people um, explore and interact with these dashboards, but they can actually use them on their own websites. So tell us a little bit about embedding uh, these maps and dashboards. Yeah, so um, this was a, one of my first projects that I worked on where I was trying to make a design that worked at different screen sizes, mobile, tablet, desktop. Um, I won't lie, that is a pain. <laughs> I mean, information graphics really relies on the juxtaposition of text labels with visual marks. And when those things all move around and you don't know exactly what they're gonna look like on the end user screen, it's really hard. Um, but there's some techniques that people come up with for that. Um, and one of the reasons that we did this mobile friendly thing is because uh, even if you're on a desktop, you might wanna take one of these visualizations and plug it into your own website. Uh, in an iframe. So a little rectangle, you can pour some of our work into your own page and you can choose a state that you wanna show. If you're writing about um, Nevada, for example, you can have it zoom right to Nevada. If you wanna show a particular flood event or a drought event at some point in time, you can choose a date you wanna show. So you've got a date filter, a time filter. Uh, and so there's a little button you can click to share it and then it'll give you the option of uh, uh, whether you wanna show just the default view, the latest view, and which will continue to update, or whether you want to show a particular time snapshot or a place, uh, then you grab the iframe code and you paste it into your site. You and I have talked about about some of the other visualizations related to water that are out there. Um, we've looked at those as inspiration, and um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about some of the other projects that you've seen related to water uh, that are using various different types of data visualization to uh, explain these issues to, to folks? Yeah, there's one that um, I just came across recently that uh, is uh, about California water. And it um, basically lets you look up your own town and see where your water is coming from and what kind of knowledge is available about uh, contamination, particulates, um, and you can see how it's connected to the wider water system. And this is a kind of a piece of vaporware that I developed screen designs for about 10 years ago until it became abundantly clear that there just wasn't enough information to be able to connect the dots. The water comes out of my tap, where did it start? You know, what reservoir, what mountain did it run off of? Uh, what animals are, are you know, uh, living in that place? Um, but this one comes pretty close to doing that and it's a very impressive piece of work. I should add one other thing. One of the most impressive uh, water visualizations I've ever seen is going on, uh, it's over 40 years old. Um, it's the California Water Atlas that was produced in 1979 under the aegis of Stuart Brand, the founder of the Whole Earth Catalog, the, one of the first internet communities, The Well, and just an all around kind of visionary guy. He worked with a governor named Jerry Brown to put this thing together and it's a huge doorstop of a of a sort of a coffee table book showing really eye-popping visualizations of, you know, what California's waterscape looked like 10,000 years ago. You know, the Central Valley, uh, you know, farmland now was a Serengeti full of saber-toothed tiger and elk and flooding, seasonal flooding. And you start to understand how this has set the table for us to <laughs> literally, you know, gorge ourselves on, on, on tremendous agricultural output that didn't just happen there by chance. Um, and, you know, you think about the context that geology has given us in other places like the Ogallala Aquifer, which underlies much of the central U.S. And this is the context that, that is important and is invisible to many people. Um, and that brings me to another thing that is a real challenge for data viz, but is important, uh, looking at resources like groundwater. Um, how do we measure something we can't even see or really even conceptualize, you know? So, you know, visualizing water can be tricky sometimes. Um, 
you know, I worked on a project at Stanford where we tried to sort of bring home the importance of groundwater and how uh, little we think about it and how little regulated it had been. So we pitched the idea of a display that basically showed a five kilometer by five kilometer cube of water suspended over San Francisco. So you could understand just how much water was removed from the Sacramento San Joaquin Valley in about a hundred years since the electric pump had been invented. We ended up presenting it as a much simpler kind of area chart, but the idea stuck with me and it was validating to see um, in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey, uh, a couple of news organizations, um, the Washington Post and also Vox uh, published illustrations showing just what it would look like, the uh, millions and millions of gallons of water that fell on Houston during that hurricane, what they'd look like relative to the skyline of the city. And I think it's a very uh, effective technique. Um, but then also uh, there's some, just some really beautiful and striking stuff, uh, Reuters, uh, their Singapore-based graphics unit did a piece about the Ganges River, which is really in, in, in a dire state now because it's just so important and it, it receives so much stormwater and wastewater runoff that it, it gets pretty filthy towards the end. Um, and they did a beautiful uh, animation that takes you from the high ground of the Himalayas all the way down. And it uses something called the Sankey flow diagram, which is used by engineers who are doing like, you know, HVAC and things like that. But it shows basically where the flow comes from and also the level of contamination that uh, is uh, happening to it as it moves down towards its, towards its mouth. So those are just a couple of things. Um, we can do another uh, second episode if you want me to continue talking about <laughs> visualization, but I guess they say, you know, show, don't tell, right? Right. And, you know, it's just really amazing the technology that's available and it just keeps getting better and better. And on the one hand, our industry journalism has been, um, you know, rocked to its core by the digital economy and the disruption associated with that. On the bright side, it has allowed journalists to do things that they never could have done. Uh, data visualization is a really great example of that. So when it comes to actually creating these data, visualiz data visualizations, um, I'm always in awe of, of your work, uh, the work of our collaborator, David Kruzma, and others in actually doing uh, this work. Um, most of these dashboards are able to automatically update themselves. Um, all of that is over my head and, um, you know, hats off to you and David and others who've been able to figure that out. But in terms of actually creating these, what are some of the tools and technologies and software that you're using, uh, to make these visualizations? You know, it was 10 years ago when I did this, uh, documentary about data visualization, um, which still has some useful information. But at the time, uh, we had just lost the main tool that we were using called uh, Adobe Flash, which was an animation tool that uh, could do tons of things, but um, was not gonna be uh, working on, on mobile devices. And Apple was basically you know, closing the door on it. Um, and it had been colonized by spammers and, and, and malicious users. So it was probably a good thing it went away. But for a while we were like, I don't know what we're gonna use. There were some, there were some uh, promising new technologies that came along. Well, those have really swept, the, the, the swept through the, the industry and, and really uh, made it possible for people to do really cool stuff. But it's extremely um, time and uh, knowledge intensive. You know, things like D3JS, for example, is one of the big ones. So it took a little bit longer, but you've started to see some consumer products that are filling the gap and making it easier for mere mortals to do, and, and I consider myself mostly mortal too, uh, to do really beautiful uh, and evocative data visualization without having to do a lot of coding. Now it's also true that if you don't, if you don't get in, don't get your hands dirty with the data, you're not necessarily going to be uh, engaging with it very much. You know, we don't want something where it's just like one click and then you just basically print it to the screen because that's really, you're not engaging with the data the way I think is necessary analytically. Um, so there are different directions you could come from. There's web, app, there's desktop applications like Tableau, which has become extremely powerful and really, really feature rich and very nuanced in what you can publish. Uh, and you can also publish to the web. Uh, then there's tools like Excel, you know, that have been around forever, but um, beneath the sort of green and white exterior, they've put a lot of new code under the hood that can do pretty sophisticated data visualizations. Um, it's kind of funny, you know, it's, it's like, uh, 
it's kind of like one of those cars that they, you know, on the outside, it looks like the same old thing, but underneath it's got like, you know, huge stereo and, and uh, like lights that glow on the ground or something. Uh, there's some web-based tools uh, that have free options and, and paid um, tiers also like Flourish, which is um, some of the real data viz ninjas who did some of the most beautiful viz work and including multimedia and animation uh, basically took their work and kind of um, rolled it into a, a, a program that almost makes it too easy to do really eye-popping stuff. I mean, it's really, really quite spectacular what you can do with Flourish. You can do, you know, rotating globe animations of flows back and forth. You can do something called a bar chart race, which is a pretty hilarious sort of uh, time series that shows uh, it's, you just have to see it. Maybe we can show it on screen. Um, so there's that. Um, but then there's also people who go more of a code route where they're working in Python or the statistical package R, which um, is not, it has a learning curve, but once you get used to it, you have ex access to an extraordinary amount of uh, pre-written scripts that you can change some parameters, swap in your own data and do incredibly powerful stuff. And you can reproduce your work. And I think that's really one of the most important things is turning it into more of like a conversation with data and other people about data, as opposed to taking a spreadsheet and printing it to some, some bizarre or beautiful or very ordinary uh, graph. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, packages like Tableau and Excel and um, even a, a simpleton like myself has been able to uh, learn some of the basics of those software packages in order to create um, some relatively simple graphics, but also um, some interactive dashboards. I'm thinking of Tableau in particular, where there's not a huge uh, amount of coding or learning curve that you have to ascend. Um, and I think it really empowers journalists and others to get into the data um, and find stories themselves rather than just you know relying on talking points. And Mitch, you got pretty deep into the data yourself. I have to say, like with a lot of these things, I started on second base with what you've been able to find, both in your research and also using GIS programs like ARC, um, which brings us to another pain point for people trying to get into visualization. Geographic information systems, data maps can be very challenging, but um, the tools for that have also matured quite a bit. And there's um, services like ArcGIS Online that uh, have become much, much simpler to use and Mapbox as well. So looking ahead, what are some of the water-related topics that you are working on as far as data visualizations? Uh, what's coming down the pike in terms of the work that you're gonna be doing going forward? Yeah, well, now that the water desk is, is up and running, um, we wanna expand on the EcoWest dashboards and look at new ways to provide water data that's um, specific to the Southwest Colorado River Basin and some more, you know, detailed views of water. Uh, so we'd like to be looking at something that's kind of a standby in this field, um, looking at the levels of Lake Powell and Lake Mead as they are really the heart of the Colorado River system, um, but to do it in a slightly more nuanced way. So I'm excited to see where that uh, goes. And um, also looking again at stream flow indicators that show how uh, water um, can come in bursts in different places around the region. Uh, the USGS has a pretty extensive network. Um, unfortunately, it's not so extensive that you could like retrace the entire river and just show exactly where all water is at all times. So it's gonna be a little bit of a challenge to do it in a way that is intuitive, but still true to the data. Um, but then there's one other thing, you know, that is unfortunate that um, the EPA is in the process of rolling back protections for against pollution in what are known as ephemeral or uh, streams. And um, we are trying to grapple with the scope of how much that might change water management and environmental protection, particularly in the West, where there's a lot more um, ephemeral streams than there are in the East. Uh, and so that's a pretty complex data set because we're talking about like even just little trickles, you know, just just um, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of miles of reaches of, of water and seeing how those connect to uh, agricultural activity in the same area, urban and industrial uh, sources as well. So that's going to be a really interesting question. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing all of it, and um, it sounds like some really interesting projects, and always great to work with you, Jeff, and really appreciate you coming on the show. 
It's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in to the Water Buffs podcast, available in audio and video formats on most major media platforms. Water Buffs is a production of The Water Desk, an independent journalism initiative based at the University of Colorado Boulder's Center for Environmental Journalism. You can learn more about us and about water issues at waterdesk.org. We're also on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. If you have a comment or have a question, please feel free to email us at waterdesk at colorado.edu. Special thanks to the executive producer and co-manager, Hannah Lee Myers, and to our graphic designer and co-developer, Jeff McGee. Be sure to check out our other episodes, and until next time, thanks for tuning in.